Today we're going to do something a little bit different. Rather than reading a psalm at the start of the worship service today, I have created a responsive reading. Many of you have done responsive readings in the past, but if you have your bulletin on the second to the last page, there's a responsive reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Does everybody have that available? Why is it important to do responsive reading? We want to get the scripture into us. We want to be able to read it in context. And it's good to have the word spoken by us. This is the New American Standard Version of the scriptures. But it's good to be able to do that. So the pastor has some words and then the congregation answers in response. You guys have the words in bold and I have the ones not in bold. Are we ready to go? All right, 1 Corinthians 15. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. Raised and dead, the first fruits fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection from the dead. Someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Each man does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body which is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it the body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is a spiritual body. Perishable nature was put on the earth. This mortal nature must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Always abounding work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, your labor is not in vain. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word recorded by the Apostle Paul for us today. As we talk about resurrection and what resurrection means to us, Lord bless our time together. Come into our house, your house, you're invited in, celebrate among us as we sing about you and sing about your glory and we sing about our hope for the future as we will be with you and we will see you face to face. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Some great music this morning, the promise of resurrection in the future. Today we get an opportunity to go into chapter 11 of the Gospel of John. I'm not going to read through it all today. It's a quite long passage. So we're going to just ask the Lord's blessing upon the preaching of his word today. Lord, we do thank you that you've given us this word. We thank you for the story that we get a chance to talk to today, the story of Lazarus and raising him from the dead. Lord, bless the time together and bless your word as we understand this story. We understand the ramifications of this story. We take it in and make it personal to us, especially on a Sunday where we celebrate your life, we celebrate communion together 
as a church family. Lord, thank you for being here. Be the words out of my mouth today. Sweet Spirit, direct every statement, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we finished up John chapter 10, that interaction between Jesus and the Jews. And we cross over into another chapter. The chapter after the Lord's public ministry has ceased. Now he's doing a little private ministry. He's going to do private ministry here with this family, Lazarus's family, Mary and Martha, a, a family that we know pretty well from different places of Scripture. And then he's going to do ministry with his disciples before he goes to the cross. We're in the last few weeks of his life when this passage has taken place. And it's really a two-act play, if you think about it. Two-act play, a story that we probably all really know pretty well. And so we'll go through the story, but I want to look at it as a, a two-act play. There's this interaction between Jesus and the disciples while he's out across the Jordan in the wilderness. That's where we left him at John chapter 10. And then there's this act in a town called Bethany, which is near Jerusalem, about two miles to the east, just on the other side of the Mount of Olives. It's a nice place to be able to see this play. But there's certain characters in the play. And the characters are Lazarus, the brother, probably the main worker of the family. Mary and Martha we know very well from different places in scripture, Lazarus's two sisters. We have the disciples that I mentioned earlier, and there's some interaction between Jesus and the disciples that's very interesting. And then there's a group of people called just the Jews. And we're going to learn a little bit about their role in this game. Of course, you have all of these people who have different aspects of this story. In John 11, we start out with the first three verses. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Well, we learn a little bit about the scene at this point. That scene is in the wilderness. They are out in the wilderness. The disciples are out in the wilderness with the Lord. The Lord retreated from ministry in Jerusalem. The Jews are out for him. They want to attack him and go after him. The Lord needs to spend some time with the disciples. And when he's out there in the wilderness, he gets this note. Word is sent to him. Lazarus is sick. It's mentioned that Mary, of the Mary and Martha crew, anoints Jesus before his burial. We'll see that in a couple of weeks. That's the beginning of John chapter 12. John is telling the story and looking back and trying to identify who these characters are. But we learn one thing here that's very important. The sisters know that Jesus loves them. The sisters know very well that Jesus loves Lazarus. They put forth a telegram of their day. They send people out, say, go find Jesus. Jesus needs to know that his brother Lazarus is ill. He needs to know it. And so get that information over to him as quickly as possible. From where Jesus was and where Bethany was, that's about a day's travel. Days travel, you got to go up around the mountain, you got to go across the river to the other side and of the Jordan, and it's a little bit of a journey to go that way. And so they were sent out to go. What do we know about Mary and Martha? The most common aspect of their life that's told is this interaction in Luke 10, where Mary and Martha are together, and the Lord shows up. Luke 10, 20, 38 to 42, it says, Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village, Jesus did. 
and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all of her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good work, which shall not be taken away from her. This may have been the Lord's first visit to their house. It could have been the beginning of a relationship. And what do we get out of this? We see that Martha is very busy with activity. She is the homemaker, the one that is probably the type A personality, wants everything done right, wants every, everything uh, cross T's and dotted I's. And Mary is different. Mary is at the Lord's feet. And when we look at the scene and we teach this subject, we see Martha is too busy with things and doesn't pay attention to the Lord. That's the perspective that we can get. Mary, on the other hand, is dedicated to the Lord, at his feet, learning from him, every word taken and soaked in by her. And we leave with that impression. And when we teach this, what do we teach? We say intimate time with the Lord is important. And Mary is an example of that. She realized the Lord of glory is in her house, and she's dedicating time to him. And we would teach, spend time with the Lord. Ministry work is important, but make sure you spend time with the Lord. That is great advice with anybody in ministry, whether they are a pastor or a ministry leader or somebody that just is in the congregation. Make time for the Lord, because that's where you really get all of the input you need to become a believer, to continue as a disciple, to learn and to grow in Christ. But is Martha a true believer? Is Martha somebody that we think is too preoccupied with busy work? That's what we come away with. We learn differently in this passage. As we look at John 11 a little bit further, we see something else about Martha John 11, 4 to 6, I have in the notes the statement. When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. A friend is sick, and he says, let's hang out in the desert for two more days. What kind of a God is this? <laughs> Your friend is sick, and you say, no, nah, I'm just going to hang out here for a little bit, and I'm not going to come right away. I'll get there eventually. A lot of people have interesting comments about Jesus' action here. But he's already told the disciples he's going to be fine. It's not going to end in death. And he spends two more days out in the wilderness. And it's interesting what we can get from this perspective. We see that Jesus loves them pretty well. Jesus is involved in their life. But we see that him say that there's another reason why Lazarus is sick. For the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. What do we learn from that? Circumstances will happen in your life. Good things will happen in your life. Bad things will happen in your life. Things that we perceive are good, we tend to ride an emotional high. Things that we see in our life that are difficult challenges, we tend to ride an emotional low. But how we react to those events in life really reveals our character. It reveals who we are in Christ. My mom gave me a lot of great guidance when I was younger. She said, no matter what happens to you, Jeffrey, don't let anybody see you any differently. Don't let anybody see you ride an emotional roller coaster up and down. I want you to be always level, unflappable. Expect it. 
And it was an interesting teaching for a young 11-year-old kid to hear that from his mother. But I've always tried to keep that level even keel and not ride the emotional set. Regardless of what happens in life, Jesus is on the throne, yes? Regardless of what happens in life, you have a future with him if you are a believer, yes? Regardless of the circumstances that happen in your life, whether you have highs or lows, whether you have wealth or you don't have a lot of wealth, he's still on the throne. We learn this from Isaiah when we read the circumstances of Isaiah's call in Isaiah chapter 6. A great king named Uzziah passed away. He was a great king. Everybody loved Uzziah. And in Isaiah 6, it records that everybody in Israel was upset. Everybody was downcast. The whole nation was mourning the death of this great king. Isaiah was mourning. Isaiah had a close relationship with the king. And so the Lord senses everybody is in mourning, and he doesn't want anybody in mourning. He doesn't want Isaiah in mourning because, you know what, he's still on the throne. And what do you see in Isaiah 6? In the days when Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up on the throne. And glory was around him, and angels were around him, and cherubim were flying in there, and there were peals of thunder and bright lights, and his glory was revealed. And Isaiah sees, no matter what happens on the planet, the Lord's still on the throne. <laughs> No matter what happens in your life, the Lord is still on the throne because that is his place. And so we learn that and we should have a character that reveals that. When circumstances happen in life, we should figure that the reason why is because God is going to be glorified in it. I remember being affected by a lady. We found out she had leukemia and she was having to go through all sorts of treatment for leukemia and she was tired and she was falling asleep all the time and it was a difficult battle. Maybe you know somebody who fought a battle like that in your life. But you could never ever get a frown out of this girl. No matter what happened into her, she was always smiling. She was always upcast. She was always joyous. And what a great testimony that she gave just by her life. And so we learn that in this circumstances as well. And was God glorified in that lady's life? Many people came to know the Lord through her example. Just her example of trust in the Lord in the most dire of circumstances. And God can be glorified in our lives when we react based on what things happen in our life and how we react with our character that reveals he is still on the throne. I wonder if you fear death. Anybody fear death? Anybody worried about death? What happens when you die? People will have different reactions to the news that they have a terminal illness. They're going to die. Everybody's going to die. <laughs> Nobody lives forever. The only people that will never experience death are those who will be alive when the Lord comes, right? We're all going to go past this. Fearing death, what does that say about our character? We'll develop that a little bit long. But I want to talk about the commitment. We see Jesus' commitment in, in verses 7 through 11. It says, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Then he said, and after that he said, to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of his sleep. What do we see out of Jesus? Jesus is going to go back to a place he knows is really close to Jerusalem. He's committed to go to this family. 
He has a purpose in going to this family. But what do we see in the disciples? The Jews are seeking to stone you, and you're going to go back there again? Jesus is not afraid. He doesn't have fear of being taken. He doesn't have fear of being killed. He's in control of his circumstances. And he says he's got a mission. I'm going to go awaken him out of his sleep. Even if the Jews are seeking him. Even if his disciples are against it. It says Jesus is the light of the world. And if anyone walks by the day, he does not stumble. They have no fear. They have the light within them. And he knows what's going to happen. He knows ahead of time what he's going to do. He knows that these events are going to be critical to the gospel message. How many of you enjoy reading the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead? It's a critical point of the gospel. It's a critical point that tells us what our future is like. But Jesus is very committed, and death does not scare him. He knows that the Father orders his steps. He knows that the Father's plan is what is laid out in front of him. He trusts implicitly in the Father. And we should have the same trust in our life as well. Oftentimes I've been in a situation, I will say, where it could have been a life or death situation. Anybody who's driven in a large city with eight lanes and a highway has probably experienced this before. Ooh, that could have been bad. I learned that early when I lived in Atlanta and I was going through my undergraduate uh, college and my master's degree before. How many close calls have you had in your life before where you go, ooh, that could have been close. I remember being in a situation where I was in a bad place. Literally in a bad place. Bars on all the windows and I was asked to go pick up something in a place like this and you start looking around and you're going like, this is not a safe place. Anybody ever been in that situation before? And I remember thinking to myself, is this how I'm going to go, Lord? <laughs> Will it end here? <laughs> is this going to be the place to go? I remember being capsized in a canoe once <laughs> in a pretty bad situation. Is this the way I'm going to go, Lord? Is this what you have in mind for me to go? But it's never the fear. It's just you're going to go somehow. You're going to go some way. If it's in an accident or if it's going to happen from an illness that's long or maybe an illness that's short or maybe a situation that involves a heart attack or a stroke. I mean, we're going to die. Do we fear it? Jesus didn't fear it. He trusted in the Father. What's interesting is to be able to see the disciples' reaction to this. Verses 12 and 13 of this, the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he's going to recover. Now, Jesus spoke of his death, and they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. The disciples didn't understand what the Lord was talking about. So the Lord has to give the facts. Has to give the facts in verses 14 to 16. So Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. He's dead. I waited two days here out in the wilderness. He's dead. He's good and dead, if we could say that. Why did he wait so long? Because Jesus wanted him good and dead. His beloved brother, he wanted him in the grave. He wanted him in the tomb. He wanted him dead. But he goes on, Jesus said, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you might believe. But let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who's called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. The disciples think this is a suicide mission. They know it's close to Jerusalem. They know it's a very common pathway out of Jerusalem. They know it's well trafficked. They know that there's an opportunity to run into the Jews. And Thomas, ever the doubting one, thinks it's a suicide mission. Why are you going back there? But when Jesus is saying, I'm committed to go back there, what does the disciple say? Let's go to. No fear of death. <laughs> if we're going to die, we're going to die. 
And so Jesus says, I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. Because you're going to see something that's going to dramatically impact you in your life. You're going to see what I think is the greatest miracle of all the miracles that Jesus did on the earth. You're going to get an opportunity to see it for yourself. I put in the notes, this is how the Lord works through difficulties in our life. Faith grows through personal struggle. Your faith grows through struggle. Now, nobody wants to deal with struggle. Nobody wants to deal with a health challenge. Nobody wants to take life flight over to Kearney, right? Nobody wants to do that. But our faith goes through that. Our faith grows through dealing with difficult circumstances, processing that, and working through them. And on the other side of difficulty is joy. On the other side of difficulty is trust. On the other side of difficulty is the Lord, who's there holding your hand the whole time. And I can remember many times in my life where I was dealing with struggle. And I didn't know how I was going to handle it. And I had to deal with it all myself, so I thought proud man than I was and then I realized you know the Lord is the one who's there holding me the whole time there with me the whole time if I would have just simply opened up my eyes and looked up and said you know <laughs> you know you know what's going on you know every path I'm going to take Lord you know every step I'm going to take you know every mistake I'm going to make and you still love me and that's the way the Lord is. And we grow through trial and tribulation. But their reaction, the disciples, what I put also in the notes is they need to have a deeper faith in Jesus. They need to have a deeper faith in him. You know how faith is when you're young? You come to the church early, you go to Sunday school, you learn about Jesus, you sing the songs, you know the story, you have a childlike faith. And then when circumstances of life take a detour, oh, now I'm off kilter, now I don't know what's going on, now I'm, now I'm unsure about it. A childlike faith runs into struggle. In many cases, childlike faith dies through struggle. I'm only going to like this if everything goes well for me. But on the other side of struggle is true faith. When you live through it and you come out the other side, you are a lot stronger. You have deeper faith. I used to love to talk to people who were in their 80s or in their 90s and they had a lifetime of faith in the Lord. And they have great stories of what they have gone through in their life. And I always look at them and I said, and you remain faithful. And invariably their response is, the Lord was with me. I trust in the Lord. The Lord was with me. Even hearing that boasts my, bolsters my faith in that somebody is ahead of me on the curve of life and they remain faithful so I can remain faithful. The disciples need deeper faith, and so they're going to get it from the Lord in this scene. Act 2 begins. Jesus goes to Bethany, near Bethany, in verses 17 to 21. So when Jesus came, he found that he, Lazarus, has already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews have come to Martha and Mary to console them, concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd only have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus and the disciples make it to Bethany. Martha knows the Lord is coming. She is out after him. And Lazarus has been dead for four days. If he stayed two days in the wilderness, and it's a one-day travel time, that's three days. Three out of the four. He's been in the tomb. 
You think about this, if you do the math, he was dead already in the tomb by the time that the guy came to Jesus and said, Lazarus is sick. He stayed those days because he was making sure that all of the burial activities had taken place. And so what do we learn from this section of Scripture? Many of the Jews come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. Jews were interesting at this point because if you weren't family-based, you didn't have a large family, they would come. You could pay Jews to come and weep with you. You could pay them, and there was a profession of weepers. Those of you guys who would love to cry, you could have had employment by just coming and crying. <laughs> I don't know how much the rate of payment would have been for something like that, but apparently a lot of them did it. In this case, you have Mary and Martha. It's a very wealthy family. We learn that from a lot of different aspects of what we learn about them in the scripture. We'll learn a little bit more about that later on in this passage about that. But they have ample resources. And they have probably brought people out to Bethany two miles to weep with them. These Jews, not necessarily believers in Jesus, but they come. And these will mourn with Mary and Martha. If you know anybody who's Jewish, you probably have heard the phrase of sitting Shiva. Sitting Shiva. There was a seven-day mourning period after somebody had passed away where you will be wearing black all over the place and you will be quiet. You won't say a whole lot. You're just mourning the death of somebody in your family. There's some movies out where they have a fun time with that. So you could always go look at that. But these guys are sitting with them for seven days afterwards. But it's interesting to see what Martha does. Martha says, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. Look at her faith and trust in the Lord. You have healing power, is what Martha is saying. We knew you could heal somebody. We've seen you heal people. You could have healed him if you only would have been here. I wonder... If Jesus would have said, yeah, well, I hung out for two days in the wilderness before I started this journey, how would they have felt about that, you know? What? You didn't come right away when I called? Well, I had some important things to do. You know, I had to pick up my flock at the dry cleaner, all that kind of stuff. It wasn't that important. Jesus doesn't go into that story, obviously. But look at her confidence in that. And then there's this section of scripture that I call the training Verses 22 to 24. What do we learn about Martha here? Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you, she says to Jesus. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. In verse 24, very interesting to see Martha's response. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Apparently, Mary was not the only one sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha learns a lot. She knows about the resurrection. She also knows that whatever Jesus asked, the Father would do for him. She's aware of this connection between Jesus and the Father. She's assured. And so, great confidence shows up in her. She knows that Lazarus will rise again in the resurrection. It's great to see that. How did we learn about the resurrection? We would read the, this passage of scripture and we learn in that. How do we teach our kids one day that you will rise in the resurrection if you believe in Jesus? It's somewhat of a difficult thing for somebody to understand. They think that the whole world is what they live on the earth. Our experience is what we see, hear, and touch. How do we teach that there's a spiritual world as well as a physical one? Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians 15. We read a little bit of that in our responsive reading. Verses 50 to 52, what does he say? Behold, I tell you a mystery. 
We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. There is new life coming if you are a believer in Jesus. There is new life coming after the last breath on the earth. You have to realize that. Martha understood that because Jesus obviously taught her that. But then in verses 25 to 29, we see the fifth I am. The fifth I am statement. You remember the four I am statements already covered in the Gospel of John? What are they? He is the bread of life. He says, I'm the bread of life. He says, I am the light of the world. He said in John 10, two of them, I am the door for the sheep and I am the good shepherd. What do we learn out of that? The bread of life, he is the sustenance. He is everything we need. His words are things that we should eat. He is the light of the world. His light provides spiritual illumination. We figure out that this world is not only a physical world, it's a spiritual world. And his light shines through us and into us that we can understand what the Bible says through the Holy Spirit in our lives. He is the door to the sheep. He is the one that go, we go into and we are protected. And he is the good shepherd. He cares for us. He loves us. He protects us. He heals our wounds. He provides protection, guidance for us every day of our life. The four I am's, and now we have the fifth one. Jesus said to her in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he says, do you believe this? Do you believe this, Martha? I am the resurrection of the life. What do we learn out of this? He's the one that provides resurrection. Not only does he provide light to our life, not only does he provide spiritual nourishment in his word, not only is he the good shepherd and the one where we get protection from as the door to the sheep, but he also can resurrect I can bring people back to life. How many places in the Bible is somebody brought back to life? Does it ever happen? It happened twice in the Old Testament. Elisha and Elijah. Usually it was a widow's son where the widow has no protection, has no income, and so a son is raised to take care of a widow. There's a, an example in the New Testament where a young girl is brought back to life. A daughter, a treasured daughter is brought back to life. And then we have Lazarus here being brought back to life. The Lord has this miraculous power. And so he asks her the question, do you believe this? Do you trust in me? Do you really trust in me? Do you believe that if you die that I can raise you again? What is her answer? Verse 27 of John 11. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. It's a good question for all of us. Do we believe that we will be resurrected if we die? Does everybody believe they will be resurrected if they die? He will. He has the power of bringing things back to life. And so why do we fear death? If we know that we will be raised again by Jesus, why do we fear death? Why is death so fearful to us? The world is all about preservation of life. Many people who do not know the Lord fear for their life to the point of, I can't go outside because I don't want to run into anybody. I've got a phobia, xenophobia. I stay away from strangers because they may hurt me. But Mary's, or Martha's answer here is great. 
I believe that you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. You can do anything you want. What great confidence that she has in him. Martha then and goes, get, goes and gets Mary and say, hey, the teacher is here. In verses 30 to 32, now Jesus had not come into the village, but was staying in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Mary is thinking a lot like Martha. Lord, you are a great healer. You would have healed our brother. Only you are here. She's in the same place that Martha is. What does she need to do? She needs to have trust. She needs to really believe that the Lord can raise people from the dead. Not just head knowledge, but experiential knowledge. If I ask you if you trust the Lord, what are you going to tell me? Do you trust the Lord? You're going to answer right away, of course I trust the Lord. It's the head that just says, yeah, I trust the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. And he will set your path straight. That's what we learn. We memorize those scriptures early on. Of course we trust the Lord, the head answer. But let me drop a bomb on your life. Do you trust the Lord? Where it's experiential, it's different, it's deeper. People who come out on the other side of a bomb dropped in their life are different. They have a deep faith, a deep trust. Lazarus' death dropped a bomb in Mary and Martha's life. We perceive that he's the only brother. He's the one who was working in the fields. If they were in Bethany, Bethany's primary activity was olives, olive crop. The Mount of Olives is right near there. A lot of money selling olive oil, isn't it? You go into the store right now, you see what olive oil gives you. <laughs> Pretty easy, right? Make a lot of money doing that. He's the primary leader of the, the business, and he's gone. That's a bomb. <laughs> but what is Jesus' reaction to Lazarus' death? This is, this is important. What's his reaction? John 11, verses 33 to 39. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then it says, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in scripture. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? Did Jesus do any miracle where he wasn't there in person and somebody was healed? He helped, healed the nobleman's son. You remember that story? One of the early signs in the Gospel of John. The guy is coming and said, I want you to heal my son. And Jesus said, your son is well. And the, son, and the nobleman heads on his way back, runs into his servants who said, by the way, your son is already healed. Jesus could have healed Lazarus remotely. He could heal anybody remotely. He didn't need to be there in person, right? What kind of a situation is this where he says, I'm going to wait until somebody has died before I show up? But it says he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled, and the Jews see him weeping. What was Jesus crying for? What was he weeping for? What do you think it means, deeply moved in spirit? Why their tears? Were they tears of sorrow and loss? Do you think Jesus is weeping because Mary is weeping about the loss of Lazarus? Jesus knows what he's going to do. He can't be weeping because of loss. He knew he was going to raise him from the dead. Jesus, when he says deeply moved, what the original language means, he was angry. He was angry. 
Why was he angry? It was a stern reaction. The Jews misinterpret his tears. Have you ever been so angry that you're brought to tears? When you're so frustrated that you're brought to tears? Why is Jesus frustrated? Why is he angry? Because he sees all of this weeping and mourning going on. What did he just tell them? I am the what? <laughs> the resurrection and the life. He just told them that he had the power to raise him from the dead, and yet everybody is still weeping with sorrow and mourning. And he's like, didn't you guys hear what I said? I'm the resurrection and the life. I can bring this guy back to life. All I got to do is call him, and he's coming back to life. But instead, they were sorrowful. Even Mary was sorrowful. And so why is Jesus angry? They had the knowledge of the resurrection, but they just didn't experience it. They didn't trust in it. And so Jesus is frustrated with them. Don't misread this. <laughs> He's frustrated with them. And so going back to that verse, verses 36 through 39, again, being deeply moved, Jesus came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus says, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be a stench. He's been in there four days. Martha, ever the practical one, telling Jesus something I'm sure he didn't know. <laughs> hey, the dude's going to smell. <laughs> what do we learn from this? These guys are pretty wealthy. Only the wealthy were put into a cave. Only the wealthy had a stone across that. Remember when Jesus dies and they put him into the tomb, he was buried with the rich man, right? He had a rich man's death. He was put into the cave and the stone was there. These guys have wealth. Martha being very practical. He's bed. He's been in there four days. I know, Martha. I know. <laughs> I know. You don't need to tell me again. How can we have... The words, I trust in Jesus, and not the belief behind it. Not the true faith behind it. I want to challenge all of us. If we're in a situation that could be difficult, a situation where death could be the result, give up fear. Give up worry. Give up anxiety. Give up doubt. If this is the way you're going to go, you know what? That's the way you're going to go, right? <laughs> I don't know how it's going to be for me, but I pray for myself and I pray for all of us that when that time comes, we look at it like next stop, heaven. <laughs> next stop, my Lord and Savior. Next stop, the eyes of the one who says he's the lover of my soul. And if you're on that light flight, like my brother Jim was one day, and I talked to him after that in the hospital, he says, you know what, Jeffrey? I wasn't worried at all. Remember that? <laughs> I wasn't worried at all. I didn't have a care in the world. I, was, I knew I was going to be just fine. Regardless of the result, I believe, Jim, you knew you were going to be just fine. And if that was the time to go on an airplane ride or a helicopter ride across town, or if that's the way you're going to go in a car accident, if that's the way you're going to go in a hospital somewhere with your pastor at your bedside, your family and loved ones around you, however it is you're going to go, have trust that your next stop is the Lord. Why will I fear? Then I have something called the revelation. The revelation. Verses 40 to 42. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it so they might believe that you sent me. A prayer Jesus has really is a praise. I want everybody here to know that I am with you and that you are with me. 
And I want everybody here to see the glory of God. I want everybody here to see what's going to happen. This was not a quiet resurrection. Jesus waited for two days so the scene would be packed. So that the Jews would be there. So that the traffic around the place would be very, very busy. He wanted this to be a public moment. That was the Father's plan. So that God's glory would be on display. Not quiet, but loud. Loud. Jesus said that Lazarus' sickness will provide God glory, reveal God's glory, and he's going to make it happen. Jesus had told us, as we read through the Gospel of John many times, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. I'm with the Father. I came out of heaven. I'm God. He said again and again to the Jews, I'm God. God can do whatever he wants because he's omnipotent. He has all the power in the world. If he wants to raise me out of a life and death situation, he'll do it. If he wants to raise Alice out of a life and death situation, he'll do it. If he wants me out of the picture and up in heaven praising him, just like the hymns we sung earlier, seeing all the angels sing, Worthy, worthy are the Lamb. We're going to sing that song one day if you believe. If you want to look up your future, Brian, it's Revelation 4 or 5, man. You're all around the throne talking about how worthy the Lamb is. That's your future if you believe. And so revealing his glory. It's almost anticlimactic when we look at the resurrection rise, the climax of the two-act play. When Jesus had said these things, verses 43 to 45, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. Unbind him and let him go. We sang that song earlier, I will rise when he calls my name. He called Lazarus' name. One day he'll call my name. One day he'll call Sydney's name. One day he'll call Don's name, Marilyn's name. And you know what you'll do? You'll come forth. Whenever it is, if you believe in Jesus and you have hope in the resurrection, one day he'll call your name. He just calls him out of the grave. You imagine what Lazarus is like in the grave, in the tomb? Did I just hear that right? <laughs> I'm bound in cloth. Thank God the Jews didn't mummify like the Egyptians did. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to move. <laughs> The Jews only lightly clothed for burial. We see that when, in the resurrection for Jesus as well. And they would put little, little different types of things inside the cloth to try to eliminate as much of the smell of body decomposition. But when he comes out, he's a smelly dude. Anybody there watching has to know this is not a fraud. It's not a fake. It can't be a fake. He's been good and dead for four days. We've been here. All of these Jews that were there watching and weeping with Mary and Martha the whole time see this happen. And they realize, how did they pull that off? There's no way that could have been a, a fake or a fraud. I saw the stone be moved away. Everybody was there. I saw Jesus say, Lazarus, come forth, and he comes out. He smells horrific. No way it could be a fraud. He just raises him from the dead with the word. You know how many things in Scripture are just done with a word? With a word. You know what creation was like? Just took a word. Resurrection? Just took a word. Revelation 19, when the Lord comes back, he slays all of his opponents with what? Just a word. <laughs> when it's God, all he needs is a word. And so what do the Jews do? 
The last verse, verse 45, many of the Jews who came to Mary saw what he had done and believed in him. Man, if you're going to raise somebody from the dead, you can draw a crowd. You can draw a crowd. And many believed in him. Well, what about us? How many of you have a family member who does not believe in Jesus? How many of you have somebody that you've probably talked to about the Lord and it's not for them? Eh, I don't believe in this. I wonder what it would be like if you died and Jesus came and raised you from the dead. Would they believe then? Presumably they would love you and be sorrowful and then when you get raised in front of them, would they believe? Wow, that's a neat trick. How about us and our trust of the Lord as we go into the table today? This table is all about remembering what the Lord did. Today, let's take a look at what the Lord did and reflect on what the Lord's going to do. One day, we will leave this place and we will go into the next phase of life. We have a choice to make while we're on the earth. Do we want that phase of life to be with the Lord or do we want it to be away from the Lord? We would all pray that ourselves and our loved ones would have faith in the Lord and be rescued from the destruction to come and to be with him in heaven. Jesus said, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do we believe that? Do we believe that? Yes. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. As we go to the table, make this communion today about true belief. When you believe in him, when you take his body and blood, the cracker and the grape juice, you're drinking to his death. That's what the Bible says. But you're drinking for his resurrection as well. And if you have confidence that the Lord will resurrect you, think about that in the time as John will play our communion song. Think about what the future is going to be like. What is that going to be, the last breath here on earth, Lord? What is my last breath going to look like? Will it be an instant? Will it be a prolonged illness? Will it be something that happens really, really fast in my life? I mean, life is precious, Lord. How many people waited and said, you know, I'll deal with you later. I'll deal with the Lord later. Right now, I just want to live my life. And then their life was over. How many people missed it because, yeah, it wasn't important right now. And then right now became eternity. Lord, be with us in this communion moment. Reassure us of our faith and trust in you. Reassure, reassure us that we will be with you in heaven one day. And if we're not planned to be there right now, make it a point where we really recommit ourselves to you. Make it a point where we ask ourselves a serious question. What if I die today? What if I die? Where am I going to go? Where will I be? Scripture says it's better to be at a funeral than a party because life and death things are important and this life is precious, Lord. How long can we go without air? How long can we go without water and food? Life is precious, Lord. Work with us in this communion time. Reassure us or convict us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Jeffrey Plummer. I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today. Our sermon video is available on our website, 
which is www.cbccne.org. On that website, you will find sermon video as well as a blog that I write each week to our fellowship here at the church. At the top of the website in the corner, you can see all of those links that can get to that information. You can also learn about our church with our church history in the About page to be able to find out what we're all about here in Cambridge, Nebraska. Again, I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today, and I pray that you have a blessed day.